in every different language you can imagine, we have the word hallelujah to mean glory to God or praise ye the Lord. And it's an exclamation of adoration unto God. Adoration is a love, a, an intimate relationship with Him, a praise and a thanks. There are other expressions we use like glory to God and praise you the Lord and praise the Lord and so forth. Other phrases that are common amongst um, born again believers. But this one is universally known and recognized and uh, all of the Bible is filled with exhortations of praising the Lord. And I think that God's Word exhorts us, it calls us in many ways to praise God to give thanks unto Him. And it is appropriate that our lives, every day, not just when we're at church, but every day, are filled with praise unto God. So this is a universal exclamation of adoration unto God. Um, praise the Lord. So uh, we, we have direction from God's Word. We have a natural feeling inside that is put there by the Holy Spirit of God. And in fact, the Holy Spirit itself, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, leads you uh, to worship and praising in G of Jesus. And I, I'd like to think that for us, praise and thanking God and worshiping God is as natural as breathing. It should be. It should be that throughout the day, when, when you have had that close miss, you know, that happens, or when a, a provision is, is given to you, or when uh, you open your lunch and, and you are about to eat. When you step out the door, when you use a tool, whenever you are doing anything that your mind can turn naturally to God and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this food. Thank you for protecting me. Thank you for the fact that I do have this item, this tool, this car, this whatever it is by which I can live a more comfortable life. Thank you. Praise you. It should be a natural thing outcome, outflow of us being filled with the Spirit of God. So when a person experiences salvation, um, one of the things that should happen is that praise should issue spontaneously. What do we mean by spontaneously? What does that mean? What's something spontaneous? Yeah. Automatic. Automatic. Straight it should away. be straight away. It should just outflow. Yeah. Unplanned, yeah. It's, it's not something you've got to think about and, and work yourself up at. It should be just a natural response. You don't think about breathing every day unless you, unless you run short of breath. And, uh, and that's a, an awful thing. And some that cannot breathe properly are conscious of their breathing. But when we don't uh, have a problem with our lungs or with our situation, we, we breathe spontaneously and without thinking and without having to worry in regards to it. And so praise, worship should flow in the very, very same manner. Uh, praise is the highest ex expression of worship unto God. But we're using two terms here that I would like to, uh, to actually define because they are important. The Bible speaks of praise in Psalms 66 and verse 2. If you're taking notes, jot these scriptures down. Psalm 66 and verse 2. It says, Sing forth the honor of his name make his great is praise glorious so w when we raise worship and praise unto god uh, it should be with some kind of impetus it should be with a genuine heart in other words something that brings glory to god make his play praise glorious uh, says the bible in psalms 48 and verse 1 it says great is the lord and greatly to be praised Psalms 48 verse 1 tells you that God is greatly to be praised. There are so many great things that God does that we need to praise Him. In the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, every moment of the day offers an opportunity for praise unto God. Praise is the highest form of worship. <clears throat> it makes us conscious of God. Now let's have a look at these two terms, and that's why we want to define them. We've used two wor two uh, terms here. One is praise, the other is worship. So let's start with worship. What is worship actually? We'll define it a bit more as we go. But worship adores and reverences God for whom He is. Okay. So when we worship God, we bow before Him. We we think in terms of who God is. Okay, well, let's quickly recognize who God is. Who is God? Yes. 
Creator. The Creator. Who else is God? Come on, quick. Put your hand up. Give, give me a quality of God. Who is God? Yes. Salvation of my soul. Salvation of my soul. Come on, someone else. Yeah. All-powerful. All-powerful. Yes, okay. What, who else is God in contest? He is Jesus. He is one who knows everything so you begin to think of who he is in terms of his attributes his qualities it's beautiful when in worship you begin to just say more than just lord and god that's something that we are used to and that is very appropriate of course for he is lord and god but what about the holy one do you worship that way and say oh praise your name or ye holy one of israel that's the title of god that's who he is he is creator, he is savior, and there is a list that goes on unendingly of who he is and what he is. Okay? So this worship is honor to his person, to who he is. And in, in worship we raise his name, we raise who he is. When we praise, and this is the other definition that I want you to notice, there is a slight difference, even though praise in itself is the highest form of worship, we find that praise appreciates and is thankful for all that he does. So we recognize who he is as we worship. And by praise, we are thankful for all he has done, all he is doing, all he is going to do. In other words, everything that God does in our lives and in the lives of others. So we have lots to thank God for, don't we? And the Bible again and again enjoins us and encourages us to be thankful, to be uh, faithfully thankful and uh, genuinely have appreciation and gratitude uh, towards God from our hearts. It seems a human trait to ask and then forget to thank. Even in Jesus' days, we read about ten lepers who came and required Jesus to heal them. Amazingly, God healed a lot of them. But only one came back to thank Him. It's just human nature, isn't it? It's a human trait. Have you done that? Oh, Lord, help me with this. Help me. Oh, Lord. And then God does. And you rejoice. And you think it's wonderful. But then you can easily forget to stop for a moment and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Praise your name. You opened the door for me. You protected me. You provided you directed me when I didn't know what to do. And so it's, it's good to remember uh, to actually thank the Lord. Okay, praise the Lord. Let's talk a little bit more about worship this morning. Um, the first uh, mention of the word worship is found where? Where do you think it's found in the Bible? Any idea? Yep. I'd say Genesis. Hey, that's a good place to start. I, I like that. <laughs> Genesis 22 and 5, in fact, and it is, it is um, in regards to a very faithful man, a man by the name of Abraham. <clears throat> in fact, he is known as the father of the faithful. And by this time, Abraham had, uh, uh, it was quite old actually, and he had a young son. His name was Isaac, his son of promise. And um, the Bible says that God spoke to him and directed him to offer up his son the son of promise and uh, this was an amazing request to actually offer him up as a sacrifice and uh, but in obedience and I want you to see the the manner uh, that uh, Abraham took in his worship he said I and the lad will go up yonder to worship he, he said that to his servants you see they took a journey his son and he and and the servants and you notice even in the picture we see the young lad carrying uh, the wood, and uh, and there is uh, Abraham with uh, the fire uh, sensor in his hand. And he turned to the servants, he says, You stay here, and the lad and I will go up to worship. Now, can you appreciate the state of this man's heart and mind at this point? He knew he was about to sacrifice his child unto God. That was what was requested, and in an act of obedience... He humbled himself to the will of God. He submitted to the direction that God gave him. And uh, even though he didn't fully understand what God was attempting to do, I'm sure, but somehow he was honoring God and, and directly reverencing his command. 
And, uh, and he didn't say, I'm going up there to say, he didn't show any of the emotion that would have been tearing up his heart. Can you, as a parent, imagine what that could have felt like? But what he said was, the lad and I will go up to worship. So worship has a, an attitude in it. It has, it has a, a very beautiful expression. And I think humility and submission is very, very much a part of what God would say is the attitude of worship. So he was really saying that even though he didn't understand what God would do or what he was up to or what God's will was, that he would subject himself to God's will merely at God's word. Now that's powerful, isn't it? And this is really true worship in the real sense of the word. So let's define true worship. What is true worship? First of all, it involves obedience. Now think about it, brother and sister. If you're not willing to be obedient to God, how are you going to get before God and worship Him? There, there is a feeling associated with this relationship with God. And when it involves worship, when it involves coming before God, it has to be uh, based in a relationship of obedience. God wants true worshipers. And true worshipers are those who start with being obedient unto God. And that implies, of course, submission. You notice in the life of Abraham, he was obedient, even though he didn't understand. Listen, you don't always have to understand what God is doing. Faith is based on trusting Him, on leaning on Him, necessarily without fully comprehending. God doesn't have to explain every detail to you and I. Sometimes He does, in His mercy, but if He doesn't, he hasn't been delinquent. He hasn't left anything out. He simply wants us to stand in faith and be submitted. So when we submit to Him and we uh, obey Him, we bring honor to the King of Kings. And this is how we honor Him. This is how we honor God and we reverence His Word by doing His righteousness His way. Amen? Praise the Lord. And so... Uh, it's our task, I guess our desire, to worship God every day of our lives, in every way. And if we're going to worship, then this is the manner, this is the attitude that we need to be taking. A one of uh, obedience and submission and of honoring unto God. There is another aspect of worship that would uh, be defined this way. That true worship involves giving unto the Lord. Uh, you notice Abraham was willing to give. God had given him this child. But Abraham was willing to return him to God, give him back. You might remember that, uh, that uh, Samuel's mom said that very thing to God. Lord, bless me with a child. And when he's a certain age, I will return. And she did. She brought him to the temple. And so receiving from God is a wonderful thing. But the giving unto the Lord is an expression of worship. And so when you give of your time, when you give of your mind, when you give of your soul unto God, yes, when you give of your money, in every way that you give unto the Lord, in whatever context you choose to give, you are actually uh, doing an act of worship if your heart is in the right place. All right, so very important that God is looking for true worship and therefore true worshipers. In fact, Jesus explained this very concept to the woman at the well in John chapter 4 and the verses uh, 23 and 24. And um, he said this, he says, But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers, say true worshipers. True worshipers. Now if there are true worshipers, there are also what? False, False worship, worshipers. Worshipers that are not true. Worshippers that are doing so out of their own volition, they're not in obedience, they're not in submission, they're not honoring God. So we need to be careful that we are defined by God as true worshippers. Okay, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in what? Spirit and in truth. Praise God. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. What does this tell you about God? He wants true worshippers. God doesn't want lip service. He wants true worshippers. People who are genuinely dedicated, consecrated in obedience and submission to say, Lord, I want to honor you with my life. I want to thank you with my heart. I want to praise you with my very soul. Amen? So, true worshippers. He seeketh such uh, to worship Him. God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Uh, we could spend a lot of time on this, just these two verses, but notice yet another clue of the kind of worship that we need to offer unto God. It's in spirit and in truth. So it's very important uh, that we 
Uh, do not merely give God lip service. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, when we sing praises, it shouldn't just be singing the words, it should be our heart meaning the words. Uh, when we come before God in worship, uh, you may not be physically in, in a position of actual pro being uh, uh, prostrated before God, although that's, that's fine, by the way. In fact, let me state something here, that sometimes it is only when we get on our knees that we actually begin to feel like we are humbling ourselves before God. Getting on our knees is more for our benefit than it is God's, actually. It reminds us. It reminds us of the kind of attitude and spirit we should have. But really, the idea is that uh, worship, which actually means to fall down or to bow down before God, is not, is not merely a physical position. It is more than that. In fact, you could be on your knees uh, physically, and yet still not on your knees in your heart and so of course it wouldn't mean a whole lot but it speaks of an attitude if you please and uh, it wouldn't mean a great deal of surrender if we were merely bowed down to God uh, in in our in our bodies but we weren't really bowed down in our hearts or honestly obedient or submitted to him so it's important that we see this as a as an attitude that said however let's say that it is important at least regularly to get on our knees before God. It reminds us. In fact, get on your face before God. It's an effort sometimes, particularly when your body is aching, <laughs> when it's uncomfortable. But to get on our knees and our face before God is a reminder for us of the right position of humility we should have. Worship doesn't require a special audience or a special place. I'm thankful for that. I'm glad that God didn't say when you worship Him, you have to be in this place. Or that when you worship Him, you have to have uh, such and such making sure that you're doing it. It's a personal thing before God. Yes, it's wonderful when we gather together in the church house and we can worship freely and encourage each other. But you can do this at home. In the privacy of your own bedroom or bathroom, wherever you choose to be, you can worship God. God will be found everywhere. Aren't you so thankful? Did you know that the Jews in the old days had to worship at the temple? Or if they weren't in Jerusalem, they had to face towards the temple. We don't have that restriction any longer. Jesus is within us. His Spirit fills us. And wherever we are, if we choose to, and we ought to, regularly we can praise and worship the Lord. So worship is this attitude of bowing down before God. Now, even if you're sitting, your heart can be truly bowing before the Lord. Your soul can be on its knees. It's an attitude. It's a beautiful attitude because worship uh, is an act of sincerity. It is a, uh, a, an offering unto God of self. And because it is the way we adore and reverence God, we should make sure we participate of it every day. In fact, several times a day. Make the habit to worship the Lord, to thank Him, uh, to glorify Him. I want to take you to a, an important uh, scripture. <clears throat> you see, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus instructed us about the attitude of worship. Uh, in Matthew 6 and 9, He said these words. He said, after this, <clears throat> after this manner, therefore, He said, pray ye. When Jesus taught His disciples to pray, he, he, he taught them about an attitude that should be present. Have a look at this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed. Say hallowed. Hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Can anybody tell me what hallowed may mean? Yes, Brother Mark. Holy. Yes, it does. It means holy be thy name. Now, you know very well that we can't add to the holiness of God. Clearly, the name of God is already hallowed, isn't it? Okay, so how is it that Jesus instructed us to pray and say, holy be your name. Can we make the name of God any holier than it is? We can't add to the holiness of God. So what kind of instruction is this? What was Jesus really saying? What is he directing us to do? Well, God was, the Lord Jesus was actually pointing us to an attitude in worship, in prayer. We know we cannot make the name of God any holier. We cannot purify God any more than he is. is isn't pure and, and holy in an absolute sense. But we can, in our own minds, with our own attitude, reflect that holiness. And I think that this is really what Jesus was teaching us. His holiness is established and does not require man, and yet we can purify 
the thought of God. We can render the holiness of God real in our own minds, in our own hearts, by having the right attitude in worship. So it's only through the right attitude that we can fulfill this prayer, and it is by having the correct uh, minds, mind and heart, if you please, that we can actually uh, render or realize or reflect the holiness of God uh, within us and to others. You see, if worship was just clapping your hands and singing uh, songs in your how, it would be just a, a fun time, perhaps. But this is much, much more than that. Worship is a reflection, a reflection unto God. It is a service unto the Lord. It is a giving unto God. Praise the Lord. So, uh, how we see God, I guess, in our minds, in our hearts, has everything to do with the kind of worship we will offer Him. Do you know some people get mad at God and then they stay mad at God? Now, do you think that's the right attitude and mindset to have as we go to worship Him? It cannot be, can it? Uh, some people are offended at God. They are. They're offended at His Word. They're offended at the truth of what He teaches. They're offended at the fact that He has asked them to do some things that they don't like to do. The fact is, He's God. He's the Lord. We are to be the servants. And if that's true, then our attitude should reflect that love towards Him and appreciation and acceptance. But certainly being offended at God is hardly the correct attitude to have uh, when uh, we come to worship for Him. The way we think of God, how we see Him in our mind and in our heart, has everything to do with the quality of the worship that we render unto Him. Um, I, I think that if we think, as we said earlier, of some of the titles uh, that apply to God from, from His Word, it will help us to see Him in the right way. For instance, the title King of Kings. What does that make you think of? Above every king. If you can imagine the glory of a, an earthly king, and boy, don't we get into the pomp and the glory and the, and the, and the expense and the money and, and, you know, of the rulers of this world. Yet Jesus is the King of Kings. It's, it's a totally different level. There is none like Him. And so... The mere titles, the mere expressions that are found in the scriptures of defining, describing God helps us to rekindle the fire, the, the vision in our minds and hearts as to how we should think of Him. If you uh, think of the Lord as the first and the last, what, what does that make you think of? What, what comes to mind when you worship and you say, Lord, you are the first and the last. You see, we're talking about having the right mindset when we come to worship. What does that make you think of? First and last. Sister Jeanette. He's eternal. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's before everything and He's after everything. But more than that, He comprehends and encompasses everything. There's nothing wider, greater in any sense. Every terminology of the Bible that titles God in some way or another is an earthly attempt at measuring God, at describing the indescribable. <laughs> at measuring the immeasurable and at, at giving a, a dimension to that which has no dimension. So you can appreciate it's going to be superlatives. It's going to be the greatest superlatives. And that's why we use language and we should have that language and that feeling and, and, and thought in our minds and feeling in our hearts and language in our lips and mouths when we worship God because He is worthy of the right worship. Remember, they that worship Him, He's looking for true worshipers, He's seeking true worshipers that worship Him in spirit and in truth. Is it truth that He is the King of Kings? Yes. Yeah, well, let's get in the spirit of that. Amen. Is it truth that He's the first and last? Yes. Well, let's get in the spirit of that. You may think of Him as the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the Savior of the world, the Redeemer, the soon coming King, and the list goes on and on and on. And in every, in every case, the shepherd, the, the, the great God, the leader, in every title that you come up with, you will find a right attitude that will uh, prepare you or uh, gear you up, if you please, or equip you for the right type of worship, the right quality of worship. So let's remember then that in worship, we adore God for all He is, and all He is to us personally depends on our attitude. 
it depends on our personal relationship with Him. And so it's really important that how we really think of God comes out in our worship. Now listen, He may be a whole lot more to the person next to you because they have a different attitude towards God. It is only to the degree that you personally have a picture of God, have an understanding of God, have a comprehension of who He is, uh, that you will find that is what He becomes to you. And so important that we come before God with the right spirit, the right attitude. I think nine times out of ten, if you've ever walked out of church empty, you've got nothing out of the worship, you've got nothing out of the meeting, it is largely because you have failed in your own attitude towards God. You see, God is always willing to give, always willing to bless, always willing to reach out to us, but it is not always us ready to receive from Him the way He wants us to. And so, very important that we have the correct attitude towards the Lord. Now, there are three ways that I want to explain our attitude. Three attitudes, if you please, uh, that our worship depends on. Firstly, naturally, our attitude towards God is important. Would you agree? Whenever we're talking worship, we're talking uh, an object of worship. And so the Bible tells us time and again that we must worship only God. God only, no one else, nothing else. And of course, we casually would say, well, of course that's the case. Who would do anything different, right? But the truth is that throughout his dealings with his people in the Old Testament, God dealt more with the problem of idolatry than any other problem. Why is this? Because, you see, we find it so incredibly easy to actually worship other than God. And that might surprise you, but idolatry is sadly alive and well in our day, in our generation, and yes, sadly amongst many Christians. So let me explain. You see, worship signifies that there has to be an object of worship, meaning that someone or something that the worship is directed towards. And when our love, when our time, when our effort, when our hearts, when our minds, when our souls are engaged in giving love and attention to another object except God, apart from God, we are worshipping an idol. And I don't care what the shape of that thing is, whether it's in the shape of a, a car or, 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 or a ring or a relationship or a, or a person, yes, even a child that you love so incredibly dear. The fact is, if that takes place, the place that belongs to God, then we have set up an idol an object of worship which is contrary to what God wants. So the right attitude must be towards God must be that we have no idols or graven images towards Him. Write these scriptures down. Beautiful uh, direction from uh, God's Word in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 26 verse 1. Read it. It says, You shall make you no idols. Say no idols. No. Nor graven image. Neither rear it up. Uh, a standing image neither shall you set up any image of stone in the land or bow down unto it for I am the Lord your God God remind me time and again I'm the object of your worship no one else can you see why the Bible says he's a jealous God yes. at that level God will not share his glory with another end of story you cannot have God and worship something else at the same time it's the wrong attitude of worship God will not accept it Notice it says uh, to have no idols. Let's go to the New Testament with a similar injunction in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21. And this is a very direct command. It says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now this is New Testament we're talking about. So we're not seeing this as only an Old Testament issue or problem. You see, it's something that's followed the people of God. The tendency of humanity and certainly what the devil would want to do is to redirect the worship that belongs to God alone on anything else in fact the devil doesn't even care what it is or who it is anything will do as long as it's not God ideally he would like it to be on him and so people think oh but I'm just being neutral I'm not following the the world or, or the devil well actually if we're not truly worshiping God remember what Jesus said God seeketh true worshipers that have God as the object of their worship alone. Hallowed be thy name. It's an attitude. It is something that we can only do with the right spirit, the right attitude. God must be the only object of our worship 
anything else will uh, amount to idolatry. So we've got to keep ourselves from idols. One of the greatest idols, unfortunately, people don't recognize is really our own selves. Uh, images, concepts, any ideal or even a cause or some I idea that we have that is either than God. Anything that takes away from God, remember, be careful, be warned. God tells you, keep yourself from idols. Amen. That's what it says. Praise the Lord. In uh, Exodus chapter 20 and verses 3 to 5, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. That's the commandment, sense of God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images uh, of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, and in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself unto them. You shall not serve them. So in context, our worship must remain towards God. And even uh, in those things that we allow our, our eyes to see, pictures in that sense, photographs, the point is that we must never replace uh, our worship for God. The object of our worship is God and God alone. In fact, we need to remain sincere in this kind of worship. Uh, brother and sister, sincere means it re real about worshiping God real and to the heart in in romans we read um, the danger of half-heartedness and insincerity when people worship and they serve anyone rather than god uh, their hearts become darkened they become sad and empty and so if you find yourself lacking in joy uh, please have a look at what you've been worshiping lately because you know whenever you worship god something amazing happens the glory of god flows back into your soul the joy of the Lord comes back inside. There's the blessing of God. And so if you're keeping God as the object of your worship, then you will find that all too often, even in the darkest trial, your mind, your heart, your soul will have strength. That's true. But if you're going through it and you find yourself lagging and unable and not able to cope and, and somehow not having the, the joy of the Lord inside, the joy of your salvation, perhaps you should look at where as your worship being addressed who is the object what is the object of your worship of light and if your focus is not God then redirect it because true worship is commanded of God sincere worship in fact the scripture says in Joshua 24 and 14 it says now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth that's Joshua 24 14 Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and serve ye the Lord. Okay, so sincerity is called by God. And in Deuteronomy 6 and 5, it speaks about you shall love the Lord your God with half your heart and half your soul and half your mind. Is that what it says? Not at all. You see, you can't have your half or a quarter or just a little bit dedicated elsewhere it says with all your heart with all your soul with all your might so let's get this right because god uh, wants us to be worshiping him alone he wants us to be sincere in our worship and he definitely wants us to be wholehearted about worshiping him so our attitude in worship towards god is very very clear and defined in scripture but you might be surprised there is also attitude towards men that is important in rendering correct worship unto God and the Bible tells us about this <clears throat> for instance in the, in the scriptures it says if you bring your gift to the altar this is found in Matthew chapter 5 and uh, verse uh, 23 24 if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has ought against you that means anything against you okay what's it say leave there your gift before the altar and go thy way and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer thy gift so one of the first things that we need to do when we come before god in worship is we have to be willing to obey god and do his righteousness willing to resolve say willing to resolve, willing to resolve. now there is a condition here okay the bible describes this the condition is that you need to be willing to be the peacemaker willing to go to the person and say what's the problem can we sort this out and be willing to forgive be willing to accept be willing to apologize if need be be willing to make it right be reconciled 
Now, what happens if that person rejects you and doesn't want anything to do with you? Well, the Bible says, as much as is in you, live peaceably with all men. You can't always, sadly, win everybody over. I wish it was that way. But we should definitely try. And when we have tried and we have done so righteously, we should leave our door open for resolution. Do you agree? Yes. Amen. And that's what, where we find our righteousness in God. So our attitude towards men must be right because if we don't have our right attitude towards our brother, how are we going to come and worship God? If we hate our brother, the Bible says, if a man says, I love God and I hate my brother, then he's a liar, the Bible says. So we need to be willing to resolve be willing to be reconciled to our brother and then come and offer uh, the gift. There is uh, another aspect of this uh, that we must always remember. Regardless of what anybody has done to you, you have a scriptural mandate of God to love them anyway. Now listen to me, that means to love them. It doesn't mean that you're going to trust them, that's earned, but the command to love is something that is given of God for all of us, regardless of what anybody has done to you. So remember, never lose your love for another human being. Always have that love there. So willing to resolve, we must love. And here's something else we must be willing to do towards men if we are going to worship God correctly. This is if you want to be a true worshiper. Do you want to be a true worshiper today? Amen. So to be a true worshiper of God, we must be willing to forgive. Mark 11.25 says this, And when you stand praying, isn't that interesting? When we come in the presence of God, we have to do something. What is it? Forgive. Forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father um, also, which is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. So it says, if you have anything against anyone, you're holding a rancor in your heart, a grudge of any kind, when you stand to pray, which is an aspect of worship, forgive. So we need to be willing to resolve. We must be willing to love at any cost, regardless of what's been done against us. And we must be willing to forgive, even if the person doesn't want our forgiveness. Even if the individual doesn't want anything to do with us, in our hearts we must have forgiven. Can you see that? We must be willing to say, you know what, I'm not holding that against that person any longer. It's, it's something I've already given over to the Lord. If they knocked on my door tomorrow and they wanted to make it right, my door would be open for that discussion, for the willingness to resolve. Can you understand what we're saying? It's not always possible to resolve and to have the kind of relationship we would like. And let's face it, we are directed of Scripture to make sure our relationships are based on trust. And that takes time to build up. But we are directed to have the right attitude, the right spirit towards men if we are going to worship the Lord. And one last one before I let you go today is that we have to have the right attitude towards the circumstances of life. All too often, our worship, our prayer, our relationship with God is actually impeded. It is stopped. It is interfered with because we have the wrong attitude towards the circumstances that God allows in our lives. Remember we said that God is in control? Nothing happens really by mere coincidence. So does that mean that even some bad things that happen, God is aware of and yes, He may have allowed them so that, yeah, that's exactly what it means. God could stop any of that. But if there is a purpose, if there is a direction, somehow that God sees fit as part of His plan, maybe just to give a message to someone else, whatever. The fact is, whatever circumstance God allows in your life, we need to be able to be thankful to the Lord. So having the right attitude towards circumstance is a necessity to be a true worshiper of God. I guess the greatest example of this would have to be Job, wouldn't he? Okay, in Job 10, uh, sorry, 1 and verses 20 to 22, and Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, and it fell upon the ground, and he worshipped. What an amazing example of what we are talking about. You couldn't ask for worse circumstances that hit that man all at once. I mean, you and I could cope with one or two things, but... but all that happened to him, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And you, you would scream for mercy and say, that's it, I can't survive. And I guess to some degree he must have felt some of that. He, he, he rent his clothes, he shaved his head, and he fell on the ground 
and instead of laying there like a blob, whimpering, feeling sorry, he started worshipping God. In the circumstance, he looked to the object of his worship, and he said this, <clears throat> Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Well, I don't think I need to say much more about the right attitude in circumstances. We have many examples in the Bible, but Job himself said, though he slay me. Now, how's that for a circumstance of life? If God kills me, I will trust Him. I will maintain my own ways before Him. So, having the right attitude towards circumstances is the right mindset to come before God. But you know what? Analyze yourself. Have a look at it. And you'll find that we all too often allow even the slightest discomfort of life to cause us angst and anguish and such a condition of mind and heart that we are in no shape to worship God. And so circumstances control us where they should actually be opportunities for worshipping the Lord. What we must do in, in circumstances is remember that we are to worship Him at all times. Not just when the time is good, not when the good times are there, but at all times. We must also remember that Jesus is what? He's worthy. He's worthy of worship whether we are on top or on the bottom, whether we're in the middle or sideways, whether the storm is raging, whether the sun is shining. God is worthy of our worship. And that's the attitude we must take. In fact, we also need to remember that it is actually a privilege that God has given us to be able to raise His name and to praise Him. Okay, let's end with this, brothers and sisters, because I think it's important to remember that He is worthy of worship. And we started by saying eternity is going to be filled with an attitude of worship. But the Bible records that there are uh, some amazing creatures and 24 elders that sit on thrones with, with crowns on their heads. Now, it's all significant, but what is more meaningful to me is that these individuals who are obviously in a glorified state, they're already in heaven, they're already sitting before the very throne of God. Wouldn't you like to be there? Yes. Amen? Yes. You know what they do? They willingly get off of their chairs, on their knees, they take their crowns and cast them before God and worship the Lord. And they worship Him that liveth forever and ever. That's the example of the attitude of worship we're talking about. It matters not if God has already glorified us to be in heaven with Him. In fact, in heaven, worship will be main center stage. It will be the main fair before God. One day you will have a robe washed white in the blood of the Lamb. You'll be standing in the presence of God. And what do you think you will be doing? Playing Monopoly? <laughs> you know the greatest aspect of being in God's presence is that we will be in a constant state of worship and praise and glorification. Amen. So if you can imagine the time of worship where you have felt at the very, 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 very best and then multiply it by so many thousands, that's heaven. A place where we'll be forever in the presence of Jesus. The breath will never run out. The voice will never end. The praises will continue to roll. Amen. And to be a part of that, to be there personally, individually, what a wonderful experience. So listen, let's develop the right attitude in worship. Amen. And start right now, today, and every day of our lives to give glory uh, to the Lord. Will you stand with me here today? We appreciate you being part of what we're doing and learning God's Word and taking care of the attitude that we give to the Lord in worship unto Him. Praise the Lord. Let's bow heads in prayer and ask the Lord's blessings on what we've heard here today. Brother Mark, can I ask you please to close the Bible study? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we are so blessed to be here.